So the sermon, what I wanted to talk about today, and I'm, I'm trying to just get the sermons on totally different topics to the things we're talking about, just to get a bit of balance for us. But I, 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 was, I was just thinking um, recently, just, just all the things I'm so thankful for from God. Um, so I thought I'd preach a sermon just um, encouraging us to remember to always give thanks, to always be thankful to God for the things that we have. Because it's so easy to take things for granted and to start to be discontent, and start to complain, because we forget how much God has actually done for us and how much God has actually given us. So the examples I'm going to go through in this sermon are obviously going to be applicable to my life because these are the things I'm thankful for. But please take the principles there and just in your own life, maybe in the different subjects that I touch on, think to yourself how God has so richly blessed your life and hopefully that in your heart you'll be so thankful to God as you reflect on these things. So let's start in Ephesians 5. I just got two passages here because I think it's interesting the different angle that they come from. Ephesians 5.20 says, Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father. I know I was trying to get away from the Trinity thing, but this is, this is one of those passages, right? Where it says, you know, are we, giving, are we giving thanks to God who's a different person and the Father who's a different person just because it's God and the Father? Unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that says give thanks for for all things. But look at what 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says. It says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So what's the difference? Well, the way I've always been taught this is, one is saying, you're for all things. So the things that you have or the things that happen to you, they're the things you're giving thanks for. But when the Bible says, in everything give, give thanks, that's like in every situation you're in. So, you know, because it's easy to give thanks to God for all things when everything's going right. But is it, are you thankful to God when everything's going wrong? When you're starting to lose things? When things are not going your way? You know, projects that you're working on are failing? Are you still giving thanks? Right? Because the Bible says here, we should still give thanks for all things. But we give thanks for all things in everything. In every situation, we give thanks. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. This is what God wants you to do. Right? This is his will. This is what he wants. Job is a great example of this, right? Where he was greatly blessed. He had great businesses, lots of riches. He lost it all. It says, Then Job arose, rent his mantle, and shaved his head, and fell down upon the ground and worshipped, and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave. So he recognized where his riches and possessions came from. And the Lord hath taken away. Look at this. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He was still thankful for God. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. And oftentimes when we complain or we're discontent, we charge God foolishly, right? A lot of, a lot of uh, you know, Christians that are out, they have the wrong perspective. They'll say things like, well, why did God let this happen? Why did God do this? They complain you know, about things. They have the wrong. They charge God foolishly sometimes. So, like I said, some of these examples are going to be for my own life. But I wanted just to go through a couple of things that we should be thankful for. I've got, I've got quite a few things listed here, so hopefully this doesn't go for too long. Now, the first area I think we should be thankful for, and we can give God thanks for, is the fact that we have life. The fact that we were even created. The fact that we're even here today, because if, if you didn't have life, you can't even be thankful in any other area. Because right? if you don't even exist, how are you going to give thanks for anything? So this enables us, it enables you to even be able to experience the other things that you can be thankful for. Look at Daniel 5 here. It says, but, um, it, this is talking about Belshazzar in Daniel 5. It says, but has lifted up thyself against the Lord, talking about Belshazzar, um, this, this evil king. And they have brought the vessels of his house before thee, and thou and thy lords, thy wives and thy concubines, have drunk wine in them, and thou hast praised the gods of silver and gold, of brass, iron, wood, and stone, which see not, nor hear, nor know. And look at this. And the God in whose hand thy breath is, and whose are all thy ways, hast thou not glorified. So he's saying you're basically blaspheming God, and he's the one, that even is, he's the one that's even keeping you alive. Right? Your breath is in his hand. All your ways are in his hand. You wouldn't even exist right now if it wasn't for God. Right? You wouldn't even be able to be, be held together. Like people think you know, we're made of molecules, molecules made of atoms, and then scientists wonder, what are, what are atoms? What's holding the atom together? 
right? It's because God is holding the atom. Look at this, Hebrews 1.3, three says, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. See, the word of God is actually holding everything together. So when they wonder, you know, why, why is this atom being held together? You know, these neutrons, oh, is it protons and neutrons and the electrons? That's what they tell us, right? The conceptual version of the atom. So you know, it's got all this energy in it. What's holding it all together? Well, God is. And what happens when they split the atom? You know, atomic bombs, how much energy is in there? That's, how, that's the power of the word of God. So the word of God is holding, it's, it's the only reason why we have life. It's holding all things together. Now, people might ask the question. They'll say things like, well, you know, if God, if God knew that people would deny him and, you know, they, they would reject him and then just go to hell, why did he even create them? And this, this is the wrong mentality because God, God is not the God of Calvinism, right? That just creates people just to damn them for his glory. No, we're told in Genesis 1 why God created man. Look here. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. I know, I'm sorry, I can't get away from this because I do have some Trinity points in here as <laughs> I go to these, go to these passages. Um, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So what I just wanted to point out here, because I know people say, oh, you know, the death knell to the, to the oneness argument is that God is an us. It uses a plural personal pronoun. And the reason why I think that argument, I, 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 I agree with that position, because I do agree that God is three persons, and that's why it uses a three a multiple person pronoun here. But what, what I think what people don't understand that are arguing for the Orthodox Trinity is that that argument could just be equally applied to God being used in a singular person pronoun. So they'll say God's three person because it uses a multiple person pronoun. And it's like, okay, well, just use your own reasoning with the singular person pronoun. And that means God is also one person. It's just, it, I think that people are not thinking their arguments through. But it says here, God, let, let us make man in our image. And look here, why? Let them have dominion. So he created man, why? To give man blessings, right? So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And look at this. And God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Look at this. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb-bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree-yielding seed. To you it shall be meat, uh, shall be for meat. So why did God create man? He created man to bless him, to have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, to bless them, to be fruitful, and to multiply, and to enjoy his creation, right? But then man sinned against God. Man rejected God, and because God is holy, that's why he created hell, for sin, right? But he created a plan for us to be saved. But when people say, why did God create man just to send him to hell? Well, God didn't create man just to send him to hell. God created man to bless you. That's why you exist. You exist. God created you so that you could be blessed by him, right? Because he wanted you to enjoy these things. And this is why we should be thankful for the life that we have, because the fact that we are even alive we should be thankful for because the you know if we didn't even like i said if we didn't even exist we couldn't be able to be thankful for anything else what's the second thing that we can be thankful for we should be thankful for our health right and when i think about health i'm, I'm talking about our body right if you think about what god has allowed us to experience by creating us think about our five senses you know sight sound or touch taste and what was the last one? I forgot now. I had it in my notes. Um, taste, touch, smell, sight, hearing is the last one. So our health, the ability to do these things, you know, I mean, the ability to move about freely, right? The fact that we can walk and we can move and we can travel places, we can do things. You know, our five senses, we, we're, the ability to eat and drink, but not only that, the ability to enjoy it. I and mean, imagine if you just had to eat, but there was no taste. There was no smell, right? Like our hearing allows us to listen to music. You know, our voice allows us to praise God. You know, our hands allow us to feel things and to touch things. You know, imagine if you could only taste something, but you couldn't feel it. You know, just, we take these things for granted. 
You know what I mean? When we, when we complain about life, about how hard life is, I mean, do you, do you stop and think that not everybody has their five senses? Yeah. Right? But you guys don't have this problem. You know, we all have our five senses and thank God that we do because we are able to use our five senses to experience the things that God has given us to enjoy in this life. Um, so the ability to eat and drink. I mean, I think that's one that a lot of people, that's why people struggle to fast, right? Because we enjoy it a lot, yeah. you know? And after you fast, like, it, it's like, I, I, I remember, because I, I was talking to John, you know, because he's trying to set up his boat and like just everything's just so difficult right now. It, and I'm sure like setting up his boat, it's like going camping. And I remember when, when me and my wife were going camping and we, you set up, okay, it's, you try and like just get a piece of toast together. And like in camping, once you, you create a piece of toast, you put some butter on it, it's like, oh man, this is the best piece of toast I've ever eaten. But it's, for some reason, when you're, in that, when you're in that situation, it's so hard, but um, it's so much more enjoyable. Uh, why was I going to Proverbs 30? The ability to move about freely, the ability to eat and drink, the ability to marry. I just wanted to mention this one because oh, in Proverbs 30 is an interesting passage here. It says, there be three things which are too wonderful for me, yea, four which I know not. The way of an eagle in the air, the way of a serpent upon a rock, the way of a ship in the midst of the sea, and look at this, and the way of a man with a maid. Right? And I'm not trying to be perverted here or anything, but you know, it's like obviously we enjoy the, uh, the company of our wife, but we also enjoy each other physically as well. That's, that's part of God's plan, right? And I just think it's amazing that you know, God allows us to enjoy these things. You know, obviously it says here in verse 20, such is the way of an adulterous woman. She eateth and wipeth her mouth and saith, I've done no wickedness. Why? Because she's destroying this beautiful thing that God created between a man and his wife. Right, because this guy's saying, hey, there are these four things that are too wonderful for me. The way a bird flies, the way a serpent crawls on the rock, the way the ship goes in the sea, the way of a man and a maid. And he says, hey, but a, an adulterous woman, a fornicator, she's just destroying this thing. She's, it's like she eats garbage, right? And she wipes her mouth and says, you know, hey, that tasted great. No, that's, that's not great. You know, an adulterous woman is destroying this beautiful thing that God has created. And I'm, what I'm talking about is, hey, the fact that we are alive and we have health, we're able to use our five senses. This is something that we are able to enjoy. We ought to be thankful for, you know, with our spouse. The Bible says here in Mark 8, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Right, so our soul is so valuable, right? We talked about life being valuable. We'll talk about eternal life a bit later. But look at what Jesus says here in Mark 9. The fact that we have these things, he says, and if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maim than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. So even though these things are so valuable that we should be thankful for, he's saying, hey, these, these things are, are worth getting rid of if it's making you go to hell, right? So he's not saying, hey, you know, if your boat offends you or your car offends you, I mean, these are things that are actually valuable of high value. And he's saying, hey, if these things offend you, it's better to not even have them, even though they're so valuable to us. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, the fire is not quenched. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. So that's another thing we should be thankful for, right? The fact that we have our five senses, the fact that we have health. You know, you know even if we lose all these other things, you know, often people, they, they will give up all their riches, they will give up all their investments if there was a way that they could receive sight, for example or there was a way that they could hear again, or a way they could walk again, you know, and you guys have these things. We have these things. These are things that we ought to be thankful for. You know, there's nobody here that is, that, that is disabled in that way. So we don't have any reason to not be thankful and not be content. What about family? Family, let's look at some passages here. You know, I'm, I'm so thankful for my wife. Whoso findeth, whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor of the Lord. Compare that to Proverbs 31.10. Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. 
You know, I'm so thankful that I'm not single. I'm not having to go at single people here. But, you know, I, I remember, like, it would, uh, you know, if somebody asked me, you know, do I ever miss those single days? No, I don't miss those single days. You know, maybe some people miss those single days if they don't have a good marriage. I've got a good marriage. And I'm, I'm thankful for it. You know, I'll, I'll, I never want to go back to those single days. And honestly, I'm, I'm so grateful to God sometimes when I think about it because I, I remember what it's like being single. You know, I remember when I was single, looking for a wife, and I remember, you know, begging to God. I'm sure a lot of people, some single people have done this, just begging to God, just thinking, God, I'm trying to serve my life, you know, use my life to serve you. I'm trying to do all the right things. But God, where is she? Yeah. Right? Yeah, had that prayer? Uh, that's a prayer that I've had, right? It's like, where is she? Where's the woman that I'm meant to marry? You know, almost turning this woman into an idol, right? I'm not saying that's the right thing to do, but this is what single people do. They turn marriage into an idol. No, no, we, sh we should always be serving God. And, you know, God will help you along the way. You know, when, you, when, when we find, we have to just take the opportunities that come to us. And, you know, I'm really thankful for, for meeting Elizabeth. I'm really thankful, uh, if you guys know the story of how I met my wife, I'm really thankful to Matthew Stuckey. Because if it, was, if it wasn't for Matthew Stuckey, I would, I would not be married to that woman right now. Because the only reason why I even went over to talk to Elizabeth is because Stuckey pushed me to go and talk to her. So if he did not do that, who knows where my life would have been, right? I could have been married to a totally different woman because then that, that event wouldn't have happened. So, you know, I'm, I'm thankful for my family. I'm thankful for my wife. You know, I'm thankful that I'm not single anymore. You know, that I have a wife that, that, that we enjoy each other's company, you know, it's, it's, and all the things that she does for me, you know, she supports me, you know, we're not in constant conflict. You know, I'm thankful for those things. Um, you know, and she wants to grow in the faith, so we support each other, not only, you know, we, we enjoy each other physically also, but also spiritually, we enjoy each other's company discussing different things. You know, I'm thankful for my children. You know, low children are in heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward, as arrows are in the hand of the mighty man, so are the children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. And sometimes, you know, I probably take this one a bit for granted. I'm sorry if this sermon just sounds like it's all about me because I'm, I'm, just, I'm just saying these are the things I'm thankful for, right? Because, you know, in, in my life, in my personal experience, you know, to having children, we've almost taking it for granted because we, we've never had any trouble, you know, having children and things like that. So for people that have trouble having children, they're probably a lot more thankful than I am. So I have to remember because I do sometimes take my children for granted. And I have to remind myself that these, these children that God have, has given me is a great reward that I have and, and these are a great, uh, something that's very valuable and I often take them for granted and, um, and I shouldn't. Right? I ought to be thankful for the things that God has given me that are so valuable in my life. What's another thing that we ought to be thankful for? So we talked about life. We talked about health, right? The fact that we can experience things with our body. We can move about. Um, thankful for our families, right? Thankful for the people in our life that support us and encourage us and, and the, people, you know, the people that we enjoy spending time with. And part of that is church. You know, I'm not just thankful for this ambiguous corporation or ambiguous organization that is the church in Punchbowl. No, when I think of the church in Punchbowl, I think of the faces that I'm looking at right now. You know, I don't think of this, this business that I'm running because if you guys weren't here, there wouldn't be a church in Punchbowl, right? The church in Punchbowl is you guys. So I'm thankful that we have a church. Look at what it says here in Hebrews 10. And I've underlined some passages because I want to I uh, make a point here. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much more as ye, that's a plural there, see the day approaching, right? So this is what church is about. It's about us, right? Church is not about one person. Church is a group of Bible-believing Christians coming together in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ as a body to edify one another and to provoke each other unto love and to good works. And that's the purpose of why we're here, to fulfill this great commission. And that's what I see church like. I see church as this spiritual home, this spiritual family that we can be a part of. And we ought to be thankful that we have people here that are like-minded, that we can bounce things off and sharpen one another and get in the fight together. 
And you know what's great about church and why I've just underlined us, our, us, one another, ourselves, is because when you come to church, you're reminded that you're not alone, Amen. right? And, you know, as much as, you know, as spiritual as it is to say, hey, you should just be able to fight this battle knowing that God is with you, hey, well, we're only flesh, right? If, if that was the case, why does church exist? Yeah. Church exists because we need to consider one another, provoke one another to love and good works, support one another, you know, and I'm no different. You know, I need, I need encouragement. You know, if, if I was all alone, I mean, I don't know how long I would be able to last if you guys weren't here, right? Supporting me, standing by me, getting in the fight together. I mean, I, I feed off that spiritual support, you know, because even though I could say, oh yeah, God is sufficient for me and it may, hopefully it never gets to that point, you know, I, I'm just a man just like anybody else. So I'm not perfect. You know, I need, I need a church to encourage me. And think about it, how, how it affects you. Because knowing that you have a, a Bible-believing church that is like-minded with you to come home to, hey, that, that gives you a bit of confidence, doesn't it? Yeah. You don't care so much about what the outside world thinks because you know you can come back to church and you know there's a group of people here that do believe the right thing. You know, it's like, it's, that's why before this church existed and we were all at different churches, you're, you're a bit less confident talking about doctrine, yeah. talking about things because you kind of like need to be accepted in that group. But now that you know, hey, well, we have a Bible-believing church that believes like I do, you don't care so much anymore. You know, it's a bit like, it's a bit like when you're dating, right? Like when, like when you're dating, you care what that person thinks because there's a lot at stake. But then when you're married, it's like you can talk to any girl. Because it's like, I don't, I've got nothing to lose now. I told you she thinks I'm a need. It doesn't matter because I'm married. I don't need you. Yeah. It's a bit like that with church. And I'm not saying that that's necessarily the right attitude to have. I'm just saying it, it, that's what I mean by it. It gives you confidence. Right? And you guys probably feel that. And I'm just telling you guys that that's how I feel too. Yeah. You know, when I get into the spiritual battle, whether it's here, soul winning, or online with other railers, you guys are the ones that give me the confidence to stand up and go, you know what, I don't care what people think. I only care what the Bible thinks. But you know what helps me to do that and stand on that is you guys, Amen. right? Because, I, because you guys are helping me, provoking me unto love and good works. So, you know, I don't need a lot of people. You know, we don't need a lot of people to get this spiritual support. We just need a few mighty men that are willing to stand with us. Right? And so I wanted to show you this passage in 2 Samuel 23 when it talks about David's mighty men. Look at this. These be the names of the mighty men whom David had, the Tachmanite that sat in the seat, chief among the captains. The same was Adino, so that's his name, the Esnite. He lift up his spear, look at this, against 800 whom he slew at one time. After him, so that's the first mighty men. Him, it seems like he's on his own here. But I mean, it seems like he went against 800 people. After him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo, the Ahohite, one of the three mighty men with David when they defied the Philistines that were there gathered together to battle. Look at this. And the men of Israel were gone. So the majority of the people had deserted them to go and fight. But this guy, Eleazar, the son of Dodo, he stood. He was one of the three mighty men that stood with David against the Philistine. So what are you getting from this passage? You're seeing that these guys, they're always outnumbered, right? When you look at these different scenarios, they're always outnumbered, but David just needed a few mighty men and he was able to stand against 800. He was able to stand against the Philistines, even though the rest of Israel had deserted them. Let's look at the third. He arose and smote the Philistines. It's talking about uh, Eliezer until his hand was weary, right? So these are the sort of mighty men that I need to stand by me, the ones that are willing to fight until they got no more fight in them. He's saying he fought to the point where he was weary. Look at this. His hand clave unto the sword. Now, what do you think that sword's talking about in the spiritual realm? His hand claving to the, cleaving to the sword? That's the word of God. That's why when we fight, we cleave to the Word of God. That's why when we fight this spiritual battle, we're always quoting the Word of God. We're always using the Word of God. We're always defending with the Word of God. And you know something interesting about the Word of God? The Bible says it's a two-edged sword, right? But some people, they treat the Word of God like a one-edged sword. What do I mean by that? They just state their position. What's an example? Matthew 28, right? 
baptized in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. The way I see that, that's like a single-edged sword. Right? A two-edged sword just goes Matthew 28, Matthew 28, Matthew 28, single-edged sword. But when we fight with the Word of God, we should be using a two-edged sword, right? Where we can say, well, whoa, Matthew 28 says, go ye therefore, because Jesus has all authority, right? So that's our one side of the edge. And then we go to the other side of the edge, where we go Acts 2.38, baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we go to Acts 8, where it says, be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Acts 10, baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus. Acts 19, baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus. 1 Corinthians 1, baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus. So we don't just use a single-edged sword because we use all of Scripture to fight, right? We use one side and the other side because we don't shy away from any Scripture. And this is what's happening in all these different arguments, right? They don't want to, they want to get away. They're not explaining these other passages. You know, it's like with my, my conversation with Tommy McMurtry. He just, what all he did is he just stated his position again, right? Just using one side of that sword. Where it's like, well, wait a second, yeah, we use the one side, but you've got to use the other side, the two-edged sword as well, and use all of Scripture, all of the sword, to defend your position. So his hand clave unto the sword, and the Lord, look at this, and the Lord wrought a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to spoil, right? So the mighty men, they're the ones doing the fighting, they're the ones standing, and then once they win the battle, that's when all the support comes, right? And they're just coming to take the glory, take the riches after them. Let's look at the last one. After him was Shema, the son of Agi, the Hararite. <clears throat> and the Philistines were gathered together into a troop. Uh, there was a piece of ground full of lentils, and the people fled from the Philistines. But he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it and slew the Philistines, and the Lord wrought a great victory. So that's how I think of when I think of church, you know, our church doesn't need to be humongous, but like with David, if he just had a few mighty men standing against him, cleaving unto the word of God, they can fight even when they're outnumbered. And, and it says here, the Lord wrought a great victory. Now let's go on to the next one. So we, we have to be thankful for our church, to thank, thankful that we have a church to be part of. And I'll, I'll blow through the next ones pretty quickly, but... You know, thankful for our home, thankful for the fact that we have food and raiment. The Bible says here, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. And we ought to be thankful that, you know, when, when I go home, like even tonight, I mean, we, we don't wonder what we're going to eat tonight. Yeah. You know, we got dinner already organized, right? We don't wonder what we're going to eat when we get home. You're going to wonder wh wh whether you're going to eat tomorrow. Are you going to wonder where you're going to sleep tonight? You know, I've got, I've got so many, and you guys know me, I, I'm not like a, I don't buy a lot of clothes and shoes and everything. I've got more t-shirts than I can even wear, yeah. right? You, just, you, you guys have that, but you just have so many t-shirts. I end up wearing the same ones and you just like never get to the rest of your wardrobe, but you just feel like, I don't want to throw them away because they're new and somebody gave them to me and I've never worn them. I've got too many t-shirts to wear. Um, you know, we ought to be thankful for these things. Um, you know, uh, let's go on to the next one. So these, one, these ones are a bit quicker. You know, home, uh, you know, thankful for the fact that we have work. Let's read Deuteronomy 8 here. When thou hast eaten and art full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes which I, which I command thee this day. Lest when thou hast eaten and art full and hast built goodly houses and dwelt therein, and when thy herds and thy flocks multiply, and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied, and all that thou hast is multiplied, then thine, heart, uh, then thine heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who led thee through that great and terrible wilderness, wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, where there was no water, who brought thee forth water out of the rock uh, of flint, who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee, and then he might prove thee, look, to do thee good at thy latter end. And thou say in thine heart, so look, they've gone into the promised land, they're multiplying, they're growing in wealth. We're talking about work, remember. And it says here, and thou say in thine heart, my power and the might of mine hand hath gotten me this wealth. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth that he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto thy fathers, as it is this day. 
So why should we, we, we be thankful for work? Because it's God that gives us the ability to even go out and make a living, right? So I'm thankful that I've got a job, right? That I have well-paid work. And, you know, even though this church isn't large enough to support me, we're able to, to live comfortably and to be able to pay the bills. And I'm thankful for that. You know, another thing I'm thankful for, you know, is our country. And yeah, I know our country is not perfect, you know, and there's a lot of corruption, but there's a lot of things we can be thankful for. You know, the Bible says here, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Saviour. So yeah, our country's not perfect, but thank God that we have the freedom to assemble. Thank God that we have somewhat freedom of speech, you know, that we're able to speak our mind and, and, and people uphold the right to be able to express differing opinions. Um, you know, thank God that we have the freedom to go soul winning. You know, we don't go out soul winning and are worried that we're going to get put in jail. And thank God that, you know, our Christian has somewhat Christian principles, you know, even though it's, it's not perfect and it's going away. But thank God as well in our country, we have the opportunity to be involved in the political process. You know, we're not in a country that's a dictatorship or things like this where we're just oppressed. We can actually get involved and make a difference. And that's something we ought to remember and to be thankful for. And I've got two more things to be thankful for. Number one, uh, one of them here is the Word of God. That we're thankful that we have the Word of God. Right? Sometimes we forget this. We forget that we should be thankful for the fact that we're able to, at the push of a button, just search the whole scriptures. You know, there wasn't always a time where it was divided into chapters and verses and be able to reference, you know, just search, you know, just type into sword searcher, just, you know, one word and just be able to pull up all the verses. That, that gives you a different perspective when you think of the Bereans who were more noble than those in Thessalonica because they searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. They're probably trying to accomplish what we would accomplish in a couple of seconds, just searching the scriptures, just seeing whether the things were so. And we ought to be thankful for that when we live in a day of technology where we just have it so easy. Second Peter 1, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honour and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So we're not f following cunningly devised fables. We're not just duped into following man's word. We ought to be thankful that we've got the word of God in our hands, searchable, all these sorts of things. Just so easy to get to. You know, you don't even need a paper version anymore. You don't even need to buy an app. It's just free online. Just go to like sites like Bible Gateway. For he received, oh, let's keep going. Um, and this voice which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him in the Holy Mount. Look at this. And we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. So I just wanted you to focus on those words. We have it, right? It's not that we don't have it. We have the word of God. We don't live in a day where people were getting killed for trying to translate it. When we have it in our language, people killed for possessing the Bible, no, we, we don't come under any sort of persecution like that. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. But look at this. The holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now, this is interesting, just heading back to the Trinity thing. is I think it's interesting here that it says holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, because in this whole Trinity debate, when people go to Hebrews 1, they often say that God, who's being mentioned here in Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, is God the Father, right? Because it's being contrasted with God the Son, who's saying, you know, he's the image of the invisible God. But look at this, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. So if they're going to say that God is the one in Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, but the Bible tells us as well that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So... Is that God the Father or is that the Holy Ghost? Or are there three that are one? Right? So I just thought that was interesting. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. So we see here a distinction between God the Father and God the Son. But it says here in 
2 Peter 1.21 that the one speaking through those prophets was the Holy Ghost. I just thought that was interesting. All right, let's go on to the next one. The last one is salvation that we ought to be thankful for. Salvation. Because you know what? The Bible says here, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. And the reason why I have this one last is because even though we lose all the others, all the things we should be thankful for, even if we lose our life, our family, our, you know, even if you know, we're scattered because of persecution and this church doesn't exist anymore, if we lose our belongings at home, if we lose our job, even if we lose the ability to get the Bible, we will never lose our salvation. We will have our salvation at the end. And we ought to be thankful for that. Let's read in Revelation 21. It says here, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So this is when God creates all things new. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Look at this. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. See, this is what we get to experience by being saved. Thank God for that. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. Now, I've just got that underlined because you haven't listened to some of my videos online. I thought it was interesting that Jesus in John 4 and in John 7, he's the one that gives the living water, if you remember. He says, if thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that saith to thee, give me to drink, thou wouldst have asked of him and he would have given thee living water. Now, what's interesting in Revelation 21 is the one that's giving the living water, which is the water of life from that fountain, is he that sat upon the throne, Right? But isn't Jesus the lamb in Revelation? So we read on, He that overcometh shall inherit all things. Thank God for that. As a child of God, there are blessings that come with being a child of God. We, there's an inheritance for us. Inherit all things. We get to partake in this new heaven and this new earth that unbelievers don't. And look at this. And I will be his God. So who's talking here? He that sat upon the throne, which is the one that gives the water of life freely and he shall be my son. So doesn't that mean the one sitting on the throne is God, the Father, right? If we're going to be his son. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, I don't think if you've ever read Revelation 21, 8 in that context, right? Because we use... Revelation 21 8 out soul winning right to show people that if they don't believe they're going to die and go to hell But in this context, it's actually comparing those that are not saved and being thrown into the lake of fire With what will be given to the people that are saved, right? We inherit all things We ought to be thankful for that because the people that don't believe They will be cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. Thank God for that, right? And you know I know it's easy to say, and I'm obviously not being incompa not, not compassionate at all, but you know, if, we if we do have the right perspective, when we go through hard times in our life, having this perspective makes it a lot easier to handle, right? Knowing that one day it's all going to be over. Yep. One day all the pain, all the sorrow, all the crying, yep. it's all going to be gone. God's got to wipe away all these tears and he's going to create all things new. Now, just three applications. So that's, that's the point of this sermon tonight. The point of this sermon tonight is just to get us to remember the things we ought to be thankful for. And the more we remember and reflect on these things, which is what the Bible tells us to do, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good rapport, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. So if we have a mindset where we're generally thinking about negative things and bad things, this is not the way God wants us to be thinking. He wants us to be more characterized, right? 
thinking on the things that are good and pure and honest and just. We ought to be thinking on these things and the more we think on them, the more we're going to be thankful for them. And the more we're thankful, there's just three things I want you guys to take away. One is it helps us to be content. Right? It helps us to be content. Now, content, like when the Bible says godliness with contentment is great gain, I feel like a lot of people preach contentment incorrectly because they, they teach contentment as though it is wrong to ever desire anything more than what you have right now, which I don't think is wrong, right? It's not wrong to want to desire other things and desire to excel, right? Desire to, to excel in your career and desire, you know, because people get this idea of contentment, like I, I should just be fine where I am and just, just coast. No, no, no. That's not, contentment means that you're happy, right? To be content means that even if you don't get the thing that you're striving for, you're still happy, right? And how do you know whether you're, you're godly with contentment? Is because when you lose everything, are you still happy, yeah. right? That's how you know whether you're content. So it says, let your co conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he had said, I will le never leave thee nor forsake thee. So that's going back to the fact that we have salvation, right? But you see here, that contentment, it's linked with covetousness. See, because people are covetous because they're not thankful. They're not content with the things that they have. And that's why we reflect on the many things that God has given us that we take for granted every day that'll help us to be happy with what we have, to be content. And it kind of is linked in with number two, that we don't complain. Jude 1.16, look, these are murmurers. This, this is talking about false prophets, but we can learn the principle here. These are murmurers complainers look at this walking after their own lusts so you see how they're not content with such things that they have they're they're, they're lustful and it says in their mouth speaketh great swelling words why having men's persons in admiration because of advantage so why do they just embellish things and or lie about things it's because they're trying to gain an advantage of a, a materialistic advantage by having these men's persons in admiration so number one is be content. Number two is don't complain. You know, don't complain about things because you've, you've, got so, you've got it so good already. What is there to complain about? The last one is the more we think on how much God has given us and how thankful we should be, that should push us to serve God. Right? That's why in Romans 12.1 it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Look at this. That you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy acceptable unto god which is your reasonable service now after hearing about all the things we should be thankful for and all the things that god has given you is it unreasonable for god to expect you to serve him of course not right but yet people think it's such a big ask to go soul winning it's such a big ask to read their bible it's such a big ask to pray it's such a big ask to come to church once a week yeah. i mean come on guys once a week, God has given you guys so much, but then yet we complain, we dare complain just to come to church, just to read our Bible. How ungrateful are we? How ungrateful are we if we have that sort of attitude? Of course we shouldn't have that attitude. You know, that's, just, that's why we, we, when we think about how much God has done for us, man, how can you not serve the Lord? It's your reasonable service. You're being unreasonable if you don't serve God. So my last challenge to you is, this is the verse I'm going to end on, Luke 12, And that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. So look at this. For unto whomsoever much is given, of, of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. So if you think about how much God has given you and it's reasonable of him, the more you are given, the more God expects from you. God expects more from us. Why? Because we've got it easy, guys. You know, we, we, like all the things we talk about, I mean, the things that we take for granted, I'm sure a large majority of the population in the world would, would love your problems if they could have everything else that came along with it, right? Just think about that for a moment. I'm sure there's so many people in the world. We've got it so good. And my challenge to you is if you've got it so good, God expects so much more from you, right? Because we have wealth. We have, you know, freedom. We have 
our health, and we have unlimited access to the Word of God, so you better get out there and start preaching the Word of God and start serving it. All right, let's pray. All right, thank you, Lord, for your Word. Um, Lord, just uh, challenge us and uh, help us to be reminded of how much, how blessed we are, Lord, and how much we have. Thank you, Lord. You know, thank you, Lord, for creating us. Thank you for blessing us and giving us everything that we have and even the power to, to, to even get more things. So I pray, Lord, that everything we have would be used to serve you. Thank you, Lord, that even if we lose it all, we'll still have a home in heaven. And um, thank you for the Lord Jesus who provided that for us. And we pray all these things in his name. Amen.